This is the fifth of five lectures on the book of Exodus. This lecture will concentrate on some theological themes in the book of Exodus. By me, I'm Dr. Joe Sprinkle. One of the themes that you find in the book of Exodus is the theme of the presence of God. God showed his presence in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. The tabernacle itself was a symbol of the presence of God in the midst of the people, in the midst of the camp. The New Testament sees the tabernacle as a type of Christ's incarnation. In John chapter 1 and verse 14, it says that the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. This implies that the tabernacle is a foreshadowing of what Christ would do in the incarnation, dwelling among us human beings. The tabernacle is also a type of heaven. In the new heavens and the new earth, God will again dwell among men, will tabernacle among men, Revelation 21 and verse 3. Even the divine name Yahweh itself seems to be an implication of his presence. Yahweh seems to mean he is he is in the sense of he is a present help in time of need, as we see in Exodus uh, chapter 3 and verse 14. And so even the very name of God revealed in this book is an indication that God is present. A second theme in the book is the fulfillment of the promise. The promise in Genesis 12 and verse 3 indicated three things. One, promise of land. Two, the promise of seed or descendants. And three, the promise of blessings, blessings on those uh, who bless Israel and cursings upon those that curse Israel. And in Israel, all the families of the earth will find blessing. Well, we see all of those to some degree in the book of Exodus, the land promise. They begin movement towards the promised land. And this is made explicit in Exodus uh, 6 and verse 8. I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We also see the seed promise. That Exodus chapter 1 indicates that the Israelites had grown so numerous that the, the Egyptians were afraid that they might join forces with their enemies and uh, take over the land. According to Numbers uh, chapters uh, 1 through 4, over the course of 430 years in Egypt, that the 70 persons of the clan of Jacob had grown to more than 600,000 men, uh, approximately two and a half million total. God had been fulfilling the seed promise. But then there's the promise of blessing. God promised blessings on Israel and says, I will bless those that bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. That's uh, Genesis 12 and verse 3. Well, Pharaoh sought in essence to curse Israel and lost his firstborn son and his army to the sea as a result. And Israel was chosen to be a kingdom of priests so as to mediate God to the nations in fulfillment of the promise to bless the nations through uh, Abraham's seed. So on the one hand, uh, they were meant to bring blessings upon the nations, but if the nations curse Israel, then uh, they will bring a curse on them instead. So that's the theme of the fulfillment of the promise. A third theme is the sovereignty of Yahweh. God's sovereignty is seen in Exodus in various ways. We have the hardening of Pharaoh's heart, which shows God's power over uh, Pharaoh. We have God's sovereignty over the gods of Egypt and over nature, as we see in the ten plagues and the parting of the Red Sea. We see how God justly punishes the world for sin in the judgment on Pharaoh and his army. The New Testament sees the ten plagues as a paradigm for God's eschatological judgment. In the book of Revelation, the, the judgment of the seals and the trumpets and the bowls all draw upon themes that are found in the book 
of Exodus, particularly in the Ten Plagues. And Paul says in Romans that the hardening of Pharaoh's heart displayed God's power, Romans 9 and verse 17. So all of these things show God's sovereignty. And then we have, fourthly, the theme of deliverance or salvation. You have the theme of deliverance from oppression, that God delivered Israel from the house of bondage, Exodus 20 and verse 2. And it shows that God is indeed opposed to oppression. And oppressed Christians have drawn courage from this theme, be it blacks in the United States during the Civil Rights Movement or in South Africa during the apartheid area. They found the words in the book of Exodus, let my people go, uh, a new meaning and a new application for today. And they were not wrong in doing this. God still hears the groans of his people, Exodus 6 and verse 5, when they are oppressed. You also have in Exodus a paradigm that we see throughout the rest of Scripture, the paradigm of God as Savior Deliverer. It says in Exodus 15 and verse 2, The Lord is my strength and my song. He has also become my salvation. That's the song of Moses, also sung by Miriam. The Exodus is one of God's greatest acts of salvation in the Old Testament. And this act of salvation begins a theme that resonates throughout all of Scripture and prepares the way conceptually for God's act of salvation in Jesus Christ. You also have the theme of worship. The book of Exodus gives some incidental lessons about worship. Our worship may differ in style from the way that the Israelites worship God, but we Christians too are to be reminded from Exodus the duty to worship God. God. You have an example of worship in Exodus 15, the Song of Moses, which uh, in response to salvation and deliverance from Pharaoh's army, which God had drowned in the Red Sea, Moses and Miriam led Israel in a song of thanksgiving. And this taught Israel to worship God for his acts of salvation and for his greatness. The tabernacle was also important. It was the center of Israel's worship. The tabernacle and its laws, as described in uh, chapters uh, 19 through 40, uh, institutionalizes Israel's obligation to worship God for who he is and what he has done. We also have the theme of God's election of Israel as his chosen nation. Israel went to Egypt as a small clan, but leaves Egypt as a nation. And thus we see uh, the nation of Israel being born. This is the birth of a nation, complete with the covenant as its constitution, covenant with its laws. So the birth of the nation came forth at the time of Passover. That would be Israel's national birthday. The Mosaic Covenant was its constitution, and it says that God chose them to be special, chose them above the other nations to be my unique people. The plague on the firstborn also shows something of God's election. In chapter 11 and verse 7, Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. God chose to establish a special relationship with Israel as a nation, as a part of his plan of salvation. Yet another theme is the theme of covenant. Exodus 19 through 24 describes the establishment of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant between Israel and God. Obedience to God's instructions were required as a part of that covenant. Covenant is a key theme in the Bible, which uh, speaks of the covenant with Noah, and the covenant with Abraham, and the covenant with Moses, later on the covenant with David. And in the New Testament, you have the new covenant inaugurated by Jesus Christ. 
And so this Mosaic covenant established at Mount Sinai and offered in chapter 19 and accepted in chapter 24 is one of the great covenants in the Bible. Related to covenant is the idea of law. God shows his righteousness in the law, and the law regulated how Israel's covenant relationship with God was to be carried out. It gave guidelines for teaching Israel how to live within that covenant relationship, and it shows something of that God is a God of justice. He demands justice and holiness from his people. Now, a little bit about law and Christians. Uh, Christians uh, often react negatively to biblical law because of New Testament statements concerning law. But those statements have primarily to do with legalism in the sense of trying to earn one's salvation by works of the law. But if you study the Old Testament itself, that really wasn't its purpose, not even originally. And there are some ways that the law remains valuable today. So the Old Testament did not teach legalism. Uh, it was not meant to be the means of establishing a relationship with God. That was a free gift. God offered them a covenant before they had done anything. But rather, it regulated the relationship once it was established. I am the Lord your God who brought you forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's a statement that God had saved them. And having saved them, he gave them the Ten Commandments. Salvation follows the covenant. It was a free gift. Uh, the law came after salvation. It was not the means of salvation. There's no legalism in the sense of earning one's own salvation in Old Testament theology. Furthermore, there is no letterism. The laws in the Old Testament are very few in number, 614 by one count. And they were not like later Pharisaic law that tried to establish every little detail of how one was to live life. Uh, rather, it gave broad guidelines, for the most part, on how to live before God. Uh, for example, uh, letterism is found in the Sabbath-day journey law in, in the uh, rabbis, but that is not a biblical law. That is something added by the rabbis to supplement biblical law, but it's not a part of the law itself. So getting bogged, bogged down in the details of law was not what the Old Testament law was about. Now, there are some ways that the law remains valuable for today. The law aids us in evangelism. Uh, people need to know the bad news, that we're sinners and guilty before God before we can appreciate the good news. And if we go over with someone the uh, statements of the Ten Commandments, we'll find that uh, this will prick their conscience to see that they have fallen short of the standards that God would expect of people and they're in need of forgiveness and salvation. Moreover, the law was a moral guide for, even is moral guide today for Christian living. The moral principles of the law are still applicable today. The moral principles of the law are still applicable, especially the broad principles found in, for example, the Ten Commandments, all of which, except for the Sabbath command, is repeated somewhere or another in the New Testament. And so looking for the moral principles in the law can still help guide us as Christians as to how to live life. Moreover, the law points typologically to Jesus Christ. The law tells us about Christ's righteousness. You can see that in the Ten Commandments and the civil laws. The law tells us about his presence in the laws about the tabernacle. The law tells about his judgment of the wicked, and that's found in the sanctions found in the law. And the law tells us something above uh, Christ's substitutionary sacrifice. We see bits of that in the Passover lamb that served as a substitute for the firstborn. And so there's quite a bit in Old Testament law that is of value even for us Christians today. 
And then finally, the law tells us something about the grace of God. God saved Israel even though they didn't merit it. They showed their lack of merit almost immediately in the golden calf incident in Exodus 32. And yet God continued to forgive. Exodus 34, 6 and 7 puts it this way, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Now, each of these things could be listed uh, separately. God is compassionately gracious. God is slow to anger. God shows faithful love to thousands of generations. And he forgives sin of every kind and degree. All these different terms for sin, wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And so God's grace is provided for, even in the sacrificial system that would be uh, used at the tabernacle that they were to build in the book of Exodus. No one keeps the law perfectly, so there had to be a means of dealing with sin and failure. And we see this in the sacrificial system at the tabernacle. We'll see more of it when we get to the book of Leviticus. It is only by God's grace that Israel could hope to have a relationship with God. And the same is true for us. So those are some themes in the book of Exodus, some theological themes in the book of Exodus. And this completes my series of lectures on the book of Exodus.